So yes, I'm Erwin Quiring, and this was joint work with Alvin Meyer and Konrad Wie from the TU Braunschweig. And let's directly start. So here we can see a source code example. Uh, and the question is, who is the author? So let's say we would like to find out if it was Alice. And authorship attribution can answer this. Uh, by identifying the author of a given source code, by identifying, um, by exploiting the individual stylistic patterns. But what if Alice has not written that? So maybe the source code here is an adversarial example. And the threat of adversarial source code examples has received only little attention so far. And in my talk today, I will present if and how uh, we can generate such samples. And you will be surprised how well it works. And because this domain, this domain of source code is so complicated, we will also, I think, learn a lot um, interesting things, how to generate adversarial examples in such complicated discrete domains. Because this is not a toy example domain, and it's quite complicated to rewrite source code. Yeah. So let's shortly recap how authorship attribution works. Before coding habits manifest in a variety of stylistic patterns, so that we need an expressive set of features for attribution. Three groups are currently used in the research um, field that are layout, lexical, and syntactic features. And um, authorship attribution finds these patterns by using machine learning. Two notable examples are the work by Kaliskan et al., uh, which has the most comprehensive feature set and we worked by Abu Hamad et al. that performed a large-scale study with recurrent neural networks. So layout features. A simple layout feature can be, for example, if we use white spaces or tabs, or the number of empty lines between our functions and statements, and how we use comments and so on. But code formatting tools like uh, C-Lang format easily remove them. And an attacker, of course, can also easily manipulate them. So insert more empty lines is quite easy. A more advanced feature can be derived from the lexical analysis uh, of a source code. We can count the number of functions. Um, I think it's a quite good feature because some developers put all their code in one function, while others use more functions to um, get a modular card code. And moreover, we can tokenize the code and obtain string-based features that implicitly describe syntax and semantics. Here we see a simple source code example where the token int occurs three times. So the developer may have a tendency to use int, while another developer would always use uh, long as a data type in C++ or C. Um, such features cannot be easily manipulated. Of course, replacing names is quite easy, but replacing data types is already more difficult since we need to adapt all its usages. Another class of features are syntax and control flow patterns from the abstract syntax tree. For instance, we could use the number of adjacent uh, tree nodes as a feature, so the joint occurrence of uh, the function and argument uh, nodes, or the if and uh, compoundment uh, tree nodes, and again, manipulating such features is quite challenging without changing the whole um, tree structure. So these features give us a broad view on the characteristics of source code, and as most learning methods operate in the, on vectors, we need to map our features to a vector space, and usually we perform some feature selection and TF-EDF weighting, and finally we train a classifier with one class per offer, and the attribution works by evaluating the score of each class and then returning the class or offer with the highest score. So back to the question of Alice is our source code offer. And now we see that Alice has not written the source code. We manipulated some specific patterns in the source code. So while here it's just Alice, what if that version would choose a victim like a real developer or a company? So it's essential that source code attribution is accurate and robust, as false allegation could have, of course, wide-reaching consequences. 
for her attack we assume an adversary with black box access. She can send a, her source code to the method and retrieve the corresponding uh, prediction scores. The training data, the features, and the learning algorithm um, are not known. In our paper, we also test the transferability scenario, where the adversary um, has some training data, but not access to the original classifier. And it also works, but I won't talk about that in my talk today. I will focus on the black box uh, scenario with uh, the available uh, classifier. We consider two types of attacks. The first is an untargeted one uh, where we want to change the classification into any other developer. And a more sophisticated attack is the targeted version where you want to change the classification into a previously chosen target developer. And this is quite challenging because we really need to mimic the um, coding habits from one, uh, we have to move the coding habits from one developer to a, another developer. To mimic a realistic attack, we also set some constraints. The, sure, the changed source code uh, should, be, should produce the same output, of course, for a given input. And the sure, um, source code should be readable and plausible. So plausible corresponds to the impossibility aspect from the image domain when we create their adversarial examples. We do not want to see that it's an adversarial example. So that's why we do not simply copy junk code from the target developer. Uh, or use unusual syntax. We could, for instance, hide some arbitrary letters in comments until we get the wanted classification. But this would not be a very sophisticated attack because we can imagine that it's easy to detect and we can easily remove code that is never used and comments are also quite easy to ignore by the classifier of when we build features. And last but not least, we do not consider layout features. They are not robust. They can be easily normalized through code formatting, and even worse, they are easily to manipulate. And in this way, we evaluate our attack under an even more difficult scenario, because we do not change layout features. So we have to change the more advanced features like lexical and syntactic features. From an adversarial learning perspective, we have a quite challenging situation here, which is different to the um, image domain, which, get a lot of, which is getting a lot of um, attention. So we operate in the problem space. This is the real world with our source code. And the classic classification happens in the feature space. So if we have a target point in the feature space, the exact position to get there is actually not really controllable. This is because we have a problem of feature correlation. Even if I could change one feature, the TF-EDF weighting as a normalization across the dimensions would distribute this change over all other dimensions. And second, we observed multiple times that even if we wanted to change one feature value, other feature values automatically um, decreased. So we wanted to increase the value of one feature, other values decreased automatically. And this is coupled with another um, group of problems. So we have domain restrictions. Uh, when I want to change int to long, for instance, I may have to change all the printf commands where it is used. So each tiny change needs to consider the problem space validity. So it, the source code should be compilable. And the smaller, smallest possible change in the problem space may already impact um, multiple features in the feature space. And third, we cannot control the amount of changes. So even if I wanted to change the feature value just by one or two, maybe it is not possible because in the problem, our problem space dictates that we, you cannot change it by one, you have to change the value by three or four. Um, yes. So. Next, the feature map is not bijective. So the other way around, if we have a feature point, it is not possible to find a valid source code with exactly these features in general, at least. So this dilemma is also relevant in other discrete domains. And I think it has not received as much attention as it should um, before. To tackle this problem and to fulfill our constraints, 
we use the following strategy, uh, which is also shown by the figure, by the way. We implement the code transformations, we implement code transformations in the problem space, so we can move there, we can modify the source code. And these movements are guided by Monte Carlo tree search from a feature space that tells us what sequences or movements uh, we should take. So in particular, we implemented 36 code transformations with lib tooling of a compiler front end uh, Clang or Clang. And we used multiple program representations such as the abstract syntax tree or the control for graph. And using the compiler here is definitely the way to go and not to implement some own solution because we can get a valid and full view on the source code. Let me explain that with an example. So here we see an API uh, transformation to replace C out by printf with printf. To this end, we use the control for graph first to find out the position of the uh, C out command before. This is relevant when we want to ch uh, print floating point values, for instance. So the set position 10 defines how many zeros or how many values we print. And then in the second step, we use the AST to find out the final data type of each entry in the C out command to create the necessary printf string. To guide this transformation, we interpret the adversarial example generation as a game and use Monte Carlo tree search, um, which some of you may know because AlphaGo used it successfully. I won't go into the details of uh, this algorithm, but in a nutshell, we create a search tree where each node corresponds to some state of a source code and each adds to a code transformation. And we evaluate multiple paths, and in this way we can evaluate uh, the impact of different uh, code transformations. So we evaluate different uh, transformations, so we get a search tree, and then based on these information, this, this information, we decide on the next move. To evaluate our attack, we consider two state-of-the-art art methods from Kaliskan et al. and Abu Hamad et al. The first method uses a random forest uh, and actually lay out lexical and syntactic features. But as I said, we do not consider layout features because it would make our attack even easier. And the second method uses um, just lexical features and a recurrent neural network, in particular an LSTM. We use the same setup as both works and we use C++ files from the Google Code Jam. The benefit from this data set is that we have authors which have solved the same problems, so the same challenges. And so we can learn coding style rather than um, problems. And our data set consists of 204 authors uh, which have solved the same eight challenges. And finally, we use a stratified and grouped KFOD cross validation where we use seven challenges for training and one for testing and the attack. So our results are that in our targeted scenario, in the untargeted scenario, we can prevent the correct attribution for both methods in almost all cases. So, while at the same time, we only change one to five lines of code in the, in the majority of cases, on average, each file has 74 lines of code, so this underlines the very targeted nature of our transformations. In the targeted scenario, where we want to impersonate another uh, developer, we can impersonate three or four developers for both methods, and the approach by Abu Ahmed Al is slightly easier to fool since it rests only on lexical features and these are, for example, um, declarations or type def declarations and so on, and they can be easily, or they are, um, can be manipulated a little bit easier. So if we take a closer look at the targeted attack, we can see that around 50% of the features are modified for Kaliskan et al. And this shows how, um, this underlines the feature correlation problem we have, um, we had to solve. It is around 18% for Abu Mat and Al on average. This is because their approach has a more dense vector. And if a feature is zero, it remains zero even after changing the source code. And at the same time, our um, final source code, again, we have very targeted changes around one to 10 lines of code that are added, modified, or removed. So if we, 
um, here's a real world example from our evaluation and we can see that we do not just add implausible garbage to the code, but uh, the code remains quite normal. Um, so normal as it can be for C++ at least to my mind. Um, in the first step, for example, we add some type devs to mimic uh, behavior um, from some developer who prefers uh, type devs. And then we also uh, replaced a for block by a while loop and we um, changed the output API. And yeah, so it re showed that the resulting adversarial example is still a normal source code, but now it is um, uh, classified as another developer we wanted to have. So to summarize the main takeaways, we have seen how to perform a black box um, attack against authorship attribution with realistic constraints. Second, we considered the problem's uh, feature space dilemma. We have seen the unique challenges of adversarial learning in a discrete domain and here uh, the source code. We um, introduced Monte Carlo tree search and the nice thing, this approach, the Monte Carlo tree search, does not depend on the learning algorithm. So it can also be for random forest. And this uh, relieves us from the burden to learn some other learning algorithm, to use some other learning algorithm, such a deep neural network, to, um, as a substitute model, and then to hope that our adversarial examples from a deep neural network transfer to the um, random forest. So here we can directly attack the random forest. And yeah, the approach is quite generic. So it's also applicable to other domains such as text or PDF malware and so on. And yeah, so one thing maybe just to conclude my talk, one takeaway should be that our paper is not only introducing another adversarial example problem uh, now for source code, but we had quite uh, some, we had some quite challenges to solve because we have a um, discrete domain here with some constraints. And so we created, we had gained some new insights how to create adversarial examples in um, so complicated domains. And yeah, finally we performed a large scale study and we conclude that current attribution methods are not secure and we need novel methods for authorship attribution. So thank you very much for your attention and questions, yeah. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, my question is, uh, in the black box setting, how many queries do you make to the model, like the target model? Um, yeah, we, so if you create the search tree, the Monte Carlo tree search, then you need for each, um, yeah, let me explain that. So you can, um, we create sequences of transformations. So we do not uh, change the source code by one transformation and then put it to the method and retrieve the score. But we create, we perform five or 10 uh, uh, modification, then we put it to the um, method. And I think around one to 300 calls are necessary for an adversarial example. Okay. So it's not as much, but um, it's not so much, but yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. Hi, Rachel yeah. Greenstead, NYU. I really am excited that you did this work. Um, Thank you very much. And, um, but I have a question about, like, so adversarial examples in the image domain, right? When you transform mm -hmm. a, a panda to, like, to be recognized as a gibbon, but humans would still obviously recognize it as a panda. So my question is here is that when you actually go through these code transformations, what the, like, the original algorithms were recognizing was the like the style of a particular program? Have you transformed the code to be in the style of the original programmer, or would like a human or some other analysis actually think that it was in the original style? So is it sort of a different qualitative class of adversarial example than the type of adversarial example where sort of the human is fooled in one way, but the do you see what I mean? Mm, yeah, I uh, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So. Actually, we stopped the attack when the classifier uh, classified the other developer. So we would have to uh, continue our attack until we can be, of course, uh, clearly sure that we completely transferred the stylistic patterns from one developer to the other. Um, but 
yeah, if you if your method um, changes the features and so on, of course, um, maybe there are some. Uh, of course, we have not changed all traces from the original developer, so they right, are so still. It's, so it's, yeah, but it still seems a little different. So. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So just as a follow-up, I think Rachel, the, I think the analogy here is that. Um, the, uh, uh, the analogy would be that the transformation should preserve the functionality, right? Yeah. Anyway, my, my question no, is... I, I think it's a little different. What Rachel was asking is whether yeah. the adversarial example that you produced, if mm -hmm. you showed it to a human, they would identify it as the person that you targeted, or they would still identify it as being yeah. from the original author. Yeah, the and thing is, if you show it to a human, I'm not sure what he would, I don't yeah. think he could actually identify anything. So these stylistic patterns are right. somewhere hidden in a lot of features in the combination. But of course, um, when I looked at my adversarial examples, sometimes I thought, okay, it's a little bit, it's fooling the classifier just because I see some characteristics of original classifier. Uh, developer, but sometimes when we performed a lot of code transformations, so 30 or 40 code transformations, actually we had uh, mimicked the coding style from the target developer, and I could not say if it's really the uh, target developer or the adversarial example, so it also fooled me. Yeah, so maybe one suggestion to look into this is would be to use the same algorithm for a different uh, problem where you would have an easier time of telling what the ground truth should be. Yeah. Okay, sorry. So um, this is a great talk to Tudor Dimitris from the University of Maryland. Um, so uh, in, in adversarial examples, people often you know talk about robust features. Are there robust features, and what are the robust features, and you know all that. So in this problem, uh, authorship uh, attribution, do you think there are any robust features? Yes. This is. Actually, I think the um, most important question after now presenting the paper, because we created the attack, and now I think researchers can create this, use this automatic attack. This, I think, is one of the um, most important advantages. We can run the attack automatically. And the features we've changed were, or I think a robust feature should capture how we solve a problem. I think this would be a robust uh, feature because we cannot automatically change something. For instance, think about if how we solve a sorting problem. Some of you uh, would use bubble sort, some of you quick sort, some of you their own. And so this mimics so how we think about how to solve the problem. And I think this is not really, this cannot be automated. Of course, a human being, there was some study about that, I think people will always be able somehow to understand how you code, but it will be much more difficult. And I think this is, would be a robust feature. So we should maybe look at the control for graph, how we solve problems, uh, and then maybe we can develop um, robust features. But I think we should not uh, try to make our classifiers somehow more robust, but we should more look at the features to uh, prevent these attacks. One last question. Uh, Vinny Monaco, Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, thank you for the talk. So there's this idea in biometrics that some users are more difficult to identify than others, the, the biometrics menagerie. Did you see the same kind of phenomenon here, where some coders were more difficult to spoof or some difficult to modify? Yeah, definitely. Code? So some people uh, used, um, for instance, if a dev developer always used some simple type devs, it was quite easy to impersonate this person. Um, but others had a very similar code to other uh, developers. And uh, then it was much more challenging to our, let's um, make a chore. Yes, it was, uh, there were developers that, was, that were harder to impersonate and others not. Let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>